that it was I was more or less maybe cast or so like uh, the actress, and it was a real important part of the whole. The thing is, I trusted him very much, so I didn't have to find out who he was. So, and he never had a second agenda, so I knew that what he was saying was true. And he had, he was not afraid to show his own incertities. And I had, of course, I had a lot, because I didn't, in the beginning, I didn't know what form a down by law should have. So there I got the most important uh, uh, directing advice or directing from him when I asked him what should I do in this story because I have no idea what style or, or, or of a photo of photography I should give. And he said, well, Robbie, it's just a fairy tale. And that was for me the only direction I got and I was very happy with it because it was not precise in that sense. So I suddenly felt free and uh, could do what I liked. And uh, <clears throat> I felt uh, yeah, extremely free there. And uh, any invention I did would fit into the film. And yeah, I could follow my instinct in a way, intuition. It was a happy production, very good. When you see, we had so little people in the crew. I think I think it was 25, everybody included. And then you can work. And then you don't need paperwork to get moving, like in so many, many films now. Huh? You could say just loud, we start at 8 o'clock. In other productions, you need a mass of paperwork to make people clear. And it's very suppressing, I must say, for me. Well, it is the, by far the director I most respect from, of all of them I've worked for be, in my life. And I feel he, he respects everybody around him, including me, because he never checks images, as so we don't have a video assist. It was an absolutely nonsense, actually, in film, except for maybe where there are stunts. Actually, it's not as stupid as as in, as in uh, a storyboard. The result is that people, when you have a video assist on the set, it's it's mentally a, a chaos then because the people who are, who are involved in shooting the film don't look anymore. They only look at the at the at the, at the video and uh, they think they will see everything. They can't imagine anymore the the boards of of an of an uh, of a shot. And I remember in the beginning days that you automatically <coughs> knew that and paid attention, and paid really paid attention. I think it was an MBL, RABL. So lightweight and no nonsense, no, not too many accessories. So that doesn't become a technical thing there. It's whatever format you have, you use special lenses you use mostly. Huh? So there's also not, nothing very special. And you have had night lenses and you had the normal cooks for the daytime. Because night, night lenses are, they don't have so nice depth of field. And the cook are beautiful lenses. I actually never have a zoom on a package. Very seldom, very, very seldom. If it must be asked for by the director because of his style of uh, telling the story. I like it much more to have no zoom <clears throat> because you tend to be lazy. You just zoom in during the shot, although you can with a mise en scène you can make the same detail, but otherwise you zoom in on, uh, clear. And I would rather leave it to the audience to have their own discoveries without uh, patronizing them by zooming in on something. 
it was a very logical choice. It is uh, high speed for night and uh, say it was that double X for interior and uh, plus X for outside when you have enough light. And you don't have the, the, the grains of the high speed film in, the, in your landscape. It was just a very logical choice. In the weeks before, I uh, made all kinds of tests with black and white film. And uh, the lab said to me, oh, that's like the old days. That means we, did, we, we, we developed it on, on a lower gamma. It was actually very basic black and white what we did. I tried out all the filters and nothing. <clears throat> there I found nothing that I could maintain through the whole film. Of course, you can do it per shot but not, or per scene. But you always have to find a thing that you can maintain through the whole film, that quality. And so my preparations were intense, but uh, <clears throat> led to something extremely simple, uh, finally. But I was always afraid of, of that the camera would, be, would make itself independent in, within a film. And my ideal at that time was that you should not feel the camera, not feel that there was a crew, or not feel that the light was made. It was actually an extremely uh, simple system. We didn't, uh, we didn't want to prove anything, except that the story would be well told without interruption of camera ac acrobatics, you know. It's one of the reasons why I liked very much that the film was shot in black and white. Because black and white, yeah, it's kind of a poem. It is like you leave out words you don't need anyway. So, and I see that in, in parallel with color, it is so that color gives you very much the superfluous information, which you don't need at all to tell the story. Like in every beginning of a film, I think over why color, why black and white, because I never leave them out as a way of expression. Seen from from my point of view as a European, is when you work on color in, in, in an, it really becomes very often an, an exotic thing, and we're not after exotic things. And it was a very good decision to do that because a lot of shots would have really harmed the film by doing it in color, because people would look at the surroundings and uh, it's like Dead Man also that in black and white it's also good because. When you're looking at exotic landscapes, you're looking at the wrong thing. So I like that when you don't need color, leave it out. And particularly in, in, in the bayou, because in that time of the year, the water comes up higher, and for some reason, all the duckweed comes up too, and makes a solid, like tennis field, tennis field thing. And we would have been baffled by that. And now it is just grayish. And all the exotic things are gone. Because it's already exotic enough to have trees in the water. If you want to shoot a scene in one important shot, then there's very often only one or two places that you can overlook everything. But it's for mainstream shooting not a problem because you just cut it up and you get it anyway. It's, it's more for directors like, like Jim and other directors that work that way, where you, they shoot their, their actors more as an ensemble, like reacting to each other in the same shot, so you don't need extra shots to show the reactions. Instead of manipulating things, like having a sequence, shooting a sequence and pick out close of everybody to to finger point how it is, how he or she reacts. It was all in, so they could freely react between each other. And I think it's just this, the close-ups are very often like, like in language you use, when you use one word too often, it loses its meaning. And it's the same as close-ups, I think, very often. The images, the shots standing so long for minutes, that if you don't have at that moment a good lighting, then it will become more obvious and obvious during that long shot that there are mistakes or wrong things in it. So you have to do extremely careful lighting for those wide shots. 
that see everything. Then it must be perfect from left to right and up to bottom. Otherwise, you see, it's film and uh, it breaks the mystery, the dream. When I shoot a scene, or light a scene, I take care of it that every corner where an actor will go to has, an, has a good lighting. He will see him. But, uh, so I don't restrict, and I don't like to restrict people with marks for lights and that. The, the reason for that is that I hate interruptions. It's just like a heartbeat. You cannot stop living and after five minutes live again. It is, that's what my main problem is with, um, with the conventional way of shooting. That you have, you lose the momentum always. Cut. It's good, thank you. you can really Where everything is cut up in little things and not so much a reaction between, between two people, but manipulated. And uh, the terrible thing is that, that you are way too long busy with filming a scene with so many, many shots and interruptions. It's like a ship, you know, if it stops it, you take much more time to get it moving again. And the process of, say, the pure profession of filming is not interesting enough for that for me. And you set it up, you set it up, at something up with all the lights and then my main zeal is as the least interruptions as possible because you give all your energy to one big moment and if you have to repeat that you can only um, repeat only copy it and that, that's always visible and makes the whole thing less believable or what what Lars von Trier once said to me I don't want to do in principle, I don't want to do more than one or two shots because then they, the actors, start acting. And it's also a thing why I like this, uh, um, I say, it, independent film. But it's, I think the time is over also because also in, totally invaded by the Union. And the bad thing about this, and I like to have it on a DVD. <laughs> Because I think the mentality and the co coherence within the team is kaput. Because everybody thinks of his own department. And we didn't have problems with that at Down by Law. Because we still were free and we're in a right of, how do you say it? A right of work state. So you could help each other. And the things that happened after me in the kind of more organized, say mainstream like films where there was a coherence was gone. Everybody was taking care of his own department, that's it. Helping each other was out of the questions because then you break those rules. And that is suffocating. It's very bad. First of all, I think I'm not a bad operator. I must I also did it my whole life. Except when I was forbidden by the union. Happy, happy. <laughs> and now they're so far the air, even after me when I'm doing that. Maybe you can compare it with somebody gives you an, uh, an order to make a painting and with a big white canvas and you make a painting on that and there's somebody else who cuts out the frame, makes their own cut into the painting. When you are disconnected, an operator, he's kind of disconnected with the center. He only does his job. I mean, that I've, I've seen that very often, that people feel less responsible, don't help with lighting, don't learn from lighting. I'm mean, talking about the operating job. And they have less to lose. They only want to have the depth of focus, their focus and, uh, and their marks. I have no uh, systems, no, no ideas how it should be done. I find it on the set. So. It's like with the script, I even can shoot on the set. I can accept shooting on the set, I even don't know. I've never seen it before. 
it's, it's like uh, meeting somebody else, you know, you have to adapt right away to the situation. <clears throat> and I never was after beauty, because I think pure beauty destroys the drama very often. Except when beauty was, would be an integral part of, of the story. I remember it was very low key, very uh, low light, and in such a way that uh, we had to actually use the street lamps as lighting. So, I mean, very, very low uh, fill light, so you will see, even when there is no light, you would still see them. But then at every street pole light would have an effect on the scene, so that's why you have the moving lights, they were real. I think I was on 1.4, it was wide open lens. Luckily we had, didn't have a scene outside that you had to see, because you become out of focus of course. You have to make your choice there. Blocking is the most important thing. So you must make a light where the blocking can take place. And if it's a general light, like this grey light in prison, then you have it actually, hmm? it is the light the, the prisoners live in also, not moody or whatever, it is just straightforward prison. Hmm? That lighting in the cell was not very great or exceptional, but also Jim wanted in, in to not see the difference between day and night in the cell, so it had a kind of general the lighting they have already, only a bit, a, bit, a bit stronger for the film, for the negative. It was, it was quite, quite simple. You know, I thought only what was very funny, their escape out of prison, where we skipped the whole thing, how they do it. Many films you see endless things, how they get out of there. And it was, I mean, we could easily skip it for the story because it was not interesting enough to see how they do it. So that's why we had to find a location where they suddenly be, would be free or, or show some way they went. And the sewers seemed to be a very good idea. Yeah, it, was, it was pitch dark, of course, there. And the only way you could, to light was showing light coming from outside. It reflects in the water against the wall. And you see the tunnel then also. Maybe it's too beautiful, but it was the only way to do it. What was more interesting was the duckweed. Because the duckweed, when you go through the swamps or bajou, they get lost there. And normally you, you leave traces. But here, duckweed was cut open by the boat, but closed again. So it took a long enough distance to show that they really had no way back to find a way back. And that's those big helpers of duckweed. Yeah, it, uh, the boat was rather unsinkable, we discovered. And we had a kind of mechanism put on the, f on the bottom of the water with controls, so you see it, wheels, and we from outside the shot, we pulled it down. First we made it very heavy, so it would go some, a little bit down. And we really had to pull very hard to get the boat down. It's always difficult to make night lighting, because you have to see something, and therefore you have to make light. And like, <clears throat> you must f fake it a bit, that you see what you want to see, and still are not too obvious lighting a scene. It should still stay night. Good rabbit, I like this little rabbit. What the eye is of the rabbit? Ah! Suddenly, boom, the rabbit dead. We had in the scene where Alberto has his long monologue about the, the rabbit. We, are, we actually have the light tower in the shot. It was draped with black cloth, so you wouldn't see it. So they can come from more from above and now have no lamps in the trees or in the shot. And say maybe a rich production would have made the same towers but farther away and higher. And would have been a day preparation before you could shoot. 
and now we had less preparation. And then you learn that, that uh, in your career that such things happen maybe once in five years. But this is a good reference. I mean, you always should have the best as norm. Even when you can't reach that norm, at least to stay alive in your inside, you must know that it's possible. So that's why I accepted the last years films that are are the best chance to come close to that, working with human beings and then just okay people. It doesn't have to be all love and, and you know, caressing each other, but I mean, there's also part of this, this, this kind of interview that you idealize maybe what has been. But still it is a norm for me. It is, I refer to that very often in the back of my head. <clears throat> and the things that I learned there, I want that same mentality back but it's more and more difficult. I think that also to do with the fact that, that he really insisted on his own cast, uh, own cameraman, and not being dictated by his studio. Maybe I learned from him, or I say I happily recognized something. I was thinking always about film, how film should be. And was happy to see that he really existed, a director like that, a human being a real human being.